Hi, I'm Chris Hadfield. Five years ago, I had the chance to visit with the scientists at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. But just recently, I saw what they're up to, and it's amazing the progress that they've made. I flew in space three times, and being away from the planet, I was very aware of the demands, the medical demands we put on our body, but I was lucky enough to have a heart that could put up with it. But for cardiac patients, it is, it is so vital what they're doing at the McEwen Stem Cell Research Institute to be able to bring stem cell therapies to improve the quality of life for those people. As, as a way to better understand it, I want you to take a look at this video. It, it'll bring some of those technologies to light. And then send it on to other people. Have a chance to share it. I think it's really important to let the world know that there is a revolution happening in this field of medicine and that Canada is leading the charge. Revolution looks like this. Revolution looks different, radical, new, a break with tradition. It looks like something that hasn't been done yet. It starts with ideas, but moves quickly into action. That's what sets it apart from the rest of history. It's a moment when the right tools and talents converge for the first time. In 1961, Till and McCulloch discovered stem cells in Toronto, changing the face of medicine forever. In 2007, Gordon Keller and Cheryl and Rob McEwen kickstart the revolution. Suddenly, the impossible seems possible. we collaborate, and we cure. Every night we go to bed thinking about it. Every morning we get up and do it. We are the pace setters, we are the change makers. This is the new, breathtaking pace of progress. This is what revolution looks like. Introducing the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. Ignite the revolution. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Christian Cote, host of the UHN podcast, Behind the Breakthrough. And the video we just saw was a wonderful example and showcase of the incredible work that's ongoing at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. And after today's conversation, we all hope you are inspired to join us in igniting the revolution. I'm excited to be here today to talk with world-leading researchers, Dr. Gordon Keller, Dr. Michael Laflamme, and Dr. Stephanie Pratza about the groundbreaking work being done in cardiac research at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. And we're grateful to all of you for joining us during this challenging time of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're hosting this virtual event to allow us to observe so social distancing and to be able to flatten the curve as well as keep everyone safe at home. Like COVID-19, heart disease is a lethal condition. It's the leading cause of death worldwide, killing almost 18 million people a year. That's a staggering statistic that underscores the urgent need for the ongoing translational research at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. One of the major causes of heart disease is heart attack, which leaves patients with scar tissue that reduces heart function 
and leads to heart failure. For others, malfunctioning pacemaker cells cause an irregular heart rhythm, requiring a surgically implanted device, an, uh, an electronic pacemaker, to override these dysfunctional cells and restore normal heart rhythm. At the McEwen Stem Cell Institute, our scientists dare to dream. What if we could use stem cells to repair the tissue damage caused by heart attacks and get rid of the need for electronic pacemakers by replacing the malfunctioning pacemaker cells? As we'll learn today, the McEwen Stem Cell Institute researchers are on the verge of making stem cell therapy for heart disease a reality. Our scientists are part of a world-class medical research hub at the University Health Network in downtown Toronto, a world-renowned institution that includes Toronto General Hospital, which was awarded the number four hospital in the world and best in Canada by Newsweek magazine in 2020. UHN is also home to a world-leading cardiac team at the Peter Monk Cardiac Center. UHN clinicians collaborate closely with researchers at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute to bring regenerative medicine for heart disease to clinical trials and improve outcomes for patients. Today, we're going to hear all about the amazing progress being made to bring regenerative cardiac therapy to patients, plus the future of cardiac stem cell therapy at UHN. And we want you to be a part of the conversation as well. So we're dedicating the final portion of today's broadcast to your questions. As you hear from Drs. Keller, Pratza, and Laflamme today, if a question comes to mind, please fire us off an email to the address you see at the bottom of your screen. That's millie.photo, F-O-T-O, at uhn.ca. All right, let's bring in our first guest, Dr. Gordon Keller, Director of the McEwen Stem Cell Institute and a premier researcher worldwide in using developmental biology to turn embryonic stem cells into cells for regenerative medicine, such as heart, blood, and liver cells. Dr. Keller has directly contributed to 17 patents and close to 200 scientific journals, articles. We're extremely fortunate to have this giant in the field of regenerative cell therapy leading the researchers at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. Dr. Gordon Keller, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Before we discuss your work at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute, I'm curious if you could just give us a brief description of what is a stem cell. Sure. Um, well, there are different types of stem cells. Uh, I think many of us are familiar with stem cells that reside in our different tissues. Perhaps the best known is the blood forming stem cell that sits in our bone marrow and uh, makes blood cells throughout our lifetime. And the reason I bring this up is these stem cells were discovered here, right here in Toronto in 1961 by James Till and Ernest McCullough. And their work established Toronto as one of the premier centers for stem cell research, and, and it has actually kept that position throughout these years. But that's not the type of stem cell we're going to talk about today. The st type of stem cell we're going to talk about today is known as pluripotent stem cells. And these stem cells have the unique distinguishing features that we believe they can make almost every cell type in the body. And in essence, they would be considered as the building blocks of, uh, of our body. And these are the stem cells that we use at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute um, uh, to, to make the different cell types that we're gonna talk about today. So Dr. Keller, explain to us, what are we seeing here? So uh, this is a, a scheme of, of the two types of pluripotent stem cells that we now work with. And in the top row, uh, you see the derivation of what we call embryonic stem cells. And these stem cells are made from uh, leftover products of in vitro fertilization. And these are the original pluripotent stem cells that uh, were, were described some years ago. And what you see at the end of this slide is uh, just the depiction of our, our ability to try and make the different cell types from these pluripotent stem cells. In the bottom row, you find a brand new way of making, you're seeing a brand new way of making pluripotent stem cells. And this takes uh, blood cells now from anyone on the face of the earth inserts four reprogramming genes into those blood cells and turns them back into a pluripotent stem cell. These are known as induced pluripotent stem cells. And from what we can tell, they're virtually identical to the embryonic stem cells in that they can make most if not all cell types in the body. These have the added feature, of course, of being able to take cells from a patient with a genetic disease, making the stem cells, 
and then making the tissue in which the disease manifests itself and then studying disease in a dish. Okay, so why is the medical community so excited uh, about stem cells? Uh, well, prior to the discovery of, uh, of these pluripotent stem cells, we didn't have access to a number of human cell types, such as heart cells and liver cells and, and, and human ner nerve cells. These stem cells offer the opportunity for us to, 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 make them in a, to make these different cell types in a Petri dish. What this allows us to do then is to, for, for the first time, have, have, have cells that we can transplant back into patients to repair those cells that are damaged by disease. So in other words, not to replace the whole organ in a certain disease, such as heart disease or diabetes, but to replace specifically those cell types that have lost function. Okay, fair enough. So clearly those stem cells hold great promise uh, to revolutionize healthcare, but there's still a lot of work to be done before we can bring these innovations to patients. The incredible researchers at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute are working hard to complete these final steps, and we're gonna hear more about them and what they're doing shortly. But Dr. Kelly, if you don't mind, I think a lot of us would be interested to explore your career path uh, and what led you to the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. Your work in this field has taken you from Canada to Switzerland, Austria, Colorado, New York. That's an impressive passport. Uh, after 20 years abroad, you returned to Toronto. So what brought you back to Canada and why did you choose to continue your research at UHN? Well, I think, uh, as I indicated, Toronto has a long-standing uh, interest in stem cell biology, a leadership position. There is a large number of investigators who are studying different aspects of stem cell biology, some of it more basic. Uh, and I thought that this provided a, a rich environment uh, to build something special. And together with the, with the support from uh, Rob and Cheryl McEwen, I felt we could, build, we could build a program that would take the findings from basic research and move it towards an application, a therapeutic application. And I saw Toronto as one of the few places in the world that would allow me to do this. And what's unique about the McEwen Stem Cell Institute's knowledge of embryonic stem cells? So we've taken the approach, and all of the investigators, we have five investigators, we've taken the approach that you have to make the right cell to treat the disease. And what I mean by that is we've taken, uh, we've gone to great lengths to make the cell that we believe is almost a direct replica of the cell that's been damaged in the body. And to us, that made sense that then these cells would function best when transplanted back into the patient. Now to do this, we've taken uh, clues from developmental biology. We've gone back to, to the biology books and asked the question of how do other animals make a heart? How do other animals make a pancreas? And it's remarkably, uh, mice, chicken, fish, they all use the same blueprint to make these organs. So we simply, well simply, we've worked for many years to adapt that blueprint to the Petri dish whereby we can take uh, pluripotent stem cells and now very efficiently direct their fate, tell them to make either a heart cell, an insulin producing cell, or a liver cell. And it's really this translation of what we call developmental biology to the Petri dish that has led us, uh, that has been very successful and allowed us to make a host of different cell types for therapeutic applications. That's amazing. What's, tell us then the overarching goal of the research that's on the go at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute then. So we're, all of the investigators have a focus and a passion to take something towards a therapeutic application. Namely, can we make a cell type that is defective in a certain disease in a patient? Can we replace the, those diseased cells or those non-functional cells with the, with the cells we've made? This is largely known as cell therapy, and these new cells will regenerate or regenerate functional tissue. So we're all kind of passionate about this, and it's a really a singular focus of the McEwen Stem Cell Institute is to develop novel cell therapies to patients. And the McEwen Stem Cell Institute, Stem Cell Institute is clearly a world leader in stem cell research. What is it that sets the institute apart in your mind? Uh, I think one of the things is, is just what I've spoken about. We are not 
diversified in the sense that we do not have investigators studying very basic mechanisms. We don't have a large number of investigators. As I said, right now we have five investigators and they're largely all committed to one disease or another, to making the right cells to try and develop novel therapeutics for either, as you will hear in, in, in a while, heart disease, uh, liver failure, diabetes, or some blood cell diseases. And, and I think that's what makes us very unique in the world. Okay, so Dr. Keller, if you don't mind, I'd like to drill down into your research a bit. Can you explain why stem cells are especially exciting for treating heart disease? Well, I think you, you indicated already in your introduction that after, say, a, an insult to the heart, such as a heart attack, we lose billions of cells. Now, the heart, to the best of our knowledge, is not a regenerative organ. So rather than making new heart cells, it makes scar tissue full of connective tissue cells that do not beat. And this large mass of not beating, non-beating cells will put a stress on the heart over time, which can lead to heart failure. So now you can imagine we are, we are looking at a situation where we can, for the first time ever, make essentially unlimited numbers of new heart cells. So if you just connect the dots and say, well, now we have the heart cells, why can't we put them into the scar tissue and make new heart tissue rather than let the patient suffer with the scar tissue? And I think you'll hear much more from Michael Aflem about this. Exactly. All right, your discovery of progenitor heart cells opened the way for this type of cell therapy. Talk to us about this discovery and the impact it's had on your research. Right, so that, uh, we, we, we made those, we, we did that work starting while I was still in New York and completed it here. And the idea there was exactly what I've been talking about is can we take the, the rules, can we take the blueprint from developmental biology and apply it to the Petri dish, to the Petri dish full of pluripotent stem cells. And we did this and we followed the path that we knew would make a heart in, norm, in, or, in model organisms. And we very successfully identified key signaling pathways that would very efficiently direct the pluripotent stem cells uh, to a beating cell. Now, once we had that, we could back up and say, well, what, what were the intermediate stages? And that allowed us to identify what we then called the progenitor cell. It was just an intermediate stage of development in the heart cell program. But if I could put a plug in for the McEwen Stem Cell Institute since that time, and that's now 12 years ago, we have broadened in, uh, considerably the number of cell types we can make. And you'll hear from Stephanie, we can now make pacemaker cells. We can make atrial cells that sit on the, the top chambers of the heart. We can make ventricular cells. We can make the outer sheath of the heart, the inner lining of the heart, which we believe will give rise to new valves. So we can essentially make most of the major cell types of the heart. And we are, hands down, the only institute in the world that can do this. So uh, we're very excited by our, by our cardiac program and we, we, we see a lot of promise going forward with the successes we've had. It's amazing. Well, thank you, Dr. Keller, for sharing your discoveries and the excitement surrounding cardiac stem cell therapy. I understand you have something special to show us. So if we can show the video, what you're seeing in this video now is a mass of beating heart cells. And these are human heart cells made from, uh, from pluripotent stem cells. And these were made over a 20-day period. And these are largely the types of cells that will be used uh, to develop these new therapies to treat heart disease. That is just mind-blowing. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Keller. I want to now bring in our next guest, Dr. Michael Laflamme, who will be speaking to us about the clinical applications for these cells. But before we move on, uh, again, a program note, we want you to be a part of the conversation. We want to hear from you. And if you have a question that comes to mind after listening to Drs. Keller, Laflamme, and Pratza, please fire us off an email at the email address below. That's millie.photo at uhn. Ca. Okay, Dr. Michael Laflamme, he's a principal investigator at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute and he holds the Robert R. McEwen Chair in Cardiac Regenerative Medicine at UHN. Dr. Laflamme's research focuses on using stem cells to develop heart cells that can be implanted and are designed to help the heart regenerate healthy muscle following a heart attack. Along with Dr. Keller, Dr. Laflamme was named UHN Inventor of the Year in 2017 
for his pioneering contributions to the study of stem cells and the field of regenerative medicine. Welcome, Dr. Laflamme. Good to speak with you. Now, as a clinician scientist with both a medical degree and a PhD, you bring a unique perspective to the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. What's the importance of clinician scientists and, and how does this perspective help you in, in your research? I'd say it, it helps in a, in a few different ways. I mean, first is obviously the motivation. So we're all really motivated to develop uh, new therapies for, for patients. But it, I'd say that's especially true, obviously, if you've met these patients and their families um, and understand you know, just how urgent the, the need really is. Um, I'm currently in a more of a diagnostic role where I'm not seeing patients, but I have in the past and I'm very involved with the heart failure service here at Toronto General Hospital and I, I know that there's that need. The, the second thing is there's, there's instances, uh, opportunities for synergy between the two paths. So sometimes uh, scientific questions arise in clinical practice, um, and we have the ability to try and address those in the laboratory. In fact, that's how I got into the, the stem cell field in the first place, is um, we were doing work, there was a question that was going on in the stem cell field, and we realized, aha, there was a way we could actually answer that using clinical uh, materials that we had had available to us. So, and I, just, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say the, the, the third thing is, um, I'm sort of an applied, translationally minded kind of guy. And uh, so I think having a, a clinical background um, helps you understand the steps that one needs to go through to, to bring a novel therapy to, to clinic as we're trying to do. I wanted to ask you, describe if you could describe some of the challenges you face while building a stem cell therapy for a regenerating heart muscle. Right, so the, the, the first challenge is we obviously need the right type of cell. And as, as Gordon alluded to, we at the McEwen uh, Stem Cell Institute think we're better at that than, than any other place in the world. Um, so not just making heart muscle cells, but the right type of heart muscle cell, in particular the ventricular heart muscle cell, that is the, uh, the cell that you lose during a heart attack. The second challenge is we need lots of those cells. Um, so in a typical human heart attack, you lose on the order of about a billion heart muscle cells. And so Gordon will have shown you what the cells look like in a Petri dish. We need to make oodles of those cells, um, a billion per person. If we're thinking about this as a therapy um, that we pr would provide to large numbers of patients, you're literally talking about trillions of cells. So we need to move this from something that we do at the, the bench in sort of boutique scale um, to a real cell manufacturing process, the kind of things that they uh, typically handle in industry. So always, I'm sure the $64 question for you is your treatment, is how close you are to treatment to reaching clinical trials and, and what else you need to get there. Yeah, so, so, so the, the goal is to try and get this into first in human studies in something like a three-year time horizon. We still got some hurdles to overcome and we can talk about those, um, but I think that that's a realistic goal. And so we're, we're really excited by that goal. Um, there's a few things that we still need to do. Um, we need to show in increasingly relevant animal models that these cells are safe and effective. That's something that we've been working on um, in my laboratory for approaching 20 years now. So the, the typical way when you have a novel therapy, you wanna bring it to clinic is you, you start off in small animal models, typically mice or rats, um, and then gradually work to models that are closer to you or I. And in our current work, we're working in a pig model of heart attacks um, because it turns out that the size, structure, and function of the pig heart is very similar to that of the human heart. Um, and so we feel like if we can prove that the cells are, are safe and effective in that model, we have the data that we need to move to the clinic. And so we've shown that they're, they're safe and effective in small animal models. Now we need to do the same work in a pig. And that's the kind of study that's ongoing in the laboratory right now. Now, Michael, I understand you have some video that you took uh, in one of your, your lab ORs. Do you mind walking us through what you've got? Yeah, so um, I thought I'd share with you some, some movies um, that, that actually illustrated another tool that we've built in, in the laboratory um, that's allowed us to address an important question. So we're, one of the things that we've been able to do in, in the laboratory is show that heart muscle cells that, uh, that we're creating that are stably engrafting these hearts are able to integrate um, electrically with the rest of the heart and contract with them synchronously 
with the host muscle. And so that's actually the sort of evidence that we're achieving not just structural regeneration, but functional regeneration with the transplantation of the cells. And the way we did that is we actually created cells, um, engineered them to flash green light every time they contract. The details aren't important. It's actually a, a protein from jellyfish that we had these cells, um, cells express. And you can actually see that here on the video. Here are small clusters of heart muscle cells, just like the ones that Gordon showed you a few moments ago. But in this case, they're actually flashing green light every time they can contract. So we actually took these cells and we can implant them in these same animal models that we've been talking about. And then we can point a camera at the surface of the heart. And if we see a flash of light from the area in which we've implanted cells, we know that they're alive and we know that they're contracting. And then we can line up the flashes of those green lights and see how that's changing over time and line it up with the electrocardiogram, the electrical signals coming from the host muscle. And we could see that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between them. Why is this important? Well, this was the first proof that the muscle that we're creating is actually capable of integration with the host, something that hasn't been shown with any other cell type. Thanks so much, Michael, for bringing your videos along to give us a, a greater insight into the work going on in your lab. Uh, I want to bring in now Dr. Stephanie Protza. She is a early career researcher and scientist at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. She first joined the Institute as a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Gordon Keller's lab. And we are very fortunate that she, after multiple interviews around the world, decided to stay right here and set her lab up here in Toronto at UHN and the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. Welcome, Dr. Pratza. Thank you, Christian. First off, I'm curious, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your research? Oh yeah, let's start with that back in March when I still remember I just came back from a stem cell conference in Keystone in the US. And everybody was already very concerned uh, when I came back to work. And the same week, uh, we were told that we had to shut down the lab completely. And with that, we lost a lot of valuable experiments. We and, of course, everybody else in the Institute, because that wasn't enough time to finish everything up. And since then, the lab had been closed uh, for three months. And during those three months, we weren't really able to be productive, because the kind of work we do isn't really home office work that you can do at your desk, at least not for three months. We um, really need the bench to work. So back in June, when we were able to uh, return to the labs, we were very happy and especially excited. If we think of the students and postdoc that's been sitting at home for three months. But we also wanted to make sure that we were returning to the labs in a safe way. And that's really where a Team UHN and the McEwen Institute have put great effort in building up an infrastructure that now allows us to work safely. So let me walk you through how it looks like now when I go to the lab. I basically come in and there's somebody screening us for uh, COVID symptoms. And once we cleared, we are getting a mask. So everybody on site is wearing a mask now. And we are limiting the amount of people in the lab space at any given time to 50%. So with that, we are working on a shift schedule, which means the first shift starts at 7 a.m. and finishes at 1 p.m. The second shift goes from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m., which is obviously not quite your regular work hours. So that's a bit challenging but it has allowed us to go back to the bench and do productive research. Uh, if I would compare it to the times before COVID, I wouldn't say it's quite the same because we don't have the same flexibility, but it's for sure much better than being back at home. So Dr. Pratza, can you describe what cells you're currently working on and what they might be used for? Yeah, so the cells that my team is working on are special cells in the heart that are responsible for initiating and coordinating the heartbeat. And they are called pacemaker cells. And without those pacemaker cells, your heart would be really slow and wouldn't be able to pump blood in a coordinated manner. And those pacemaker cells can be uh, failing due to aging or diseases. And these patients usually have symptoms reaching from fatigue all the way to just simply losing consciousness. And the current standard treatment is the implantation of an electronic pacemaker device that then takes over the electric activation of the heartbeat. And there's about 21,000 electronic pacemakers implanted per year in Canada alone. And if you look across the border to the US, there's 180,000 pacemakers being implanted every year. And those electric devices are great because they're saving lives, but they also come with a couple of disadvantages. 
there's risk of infections of the pacemaker leads that are inserted into the heart, then it is a device. It's not like your natural pacemaker and it isn't quite as good as your natural pacemaker in responding to your bodily needs in, uh, for example, increasing your heart rate under stress or physical activity. It also is electric and needs to be driven by batteries and those need to be replaced by surgery every five to 10 years. And lastly, the device cannot grow. If you think about children, pediatric patients getting it implanted, it can't adjust to the crows of heart. So really for those young patients, there's a lot of more disadvantages because throughout their lifetime, they have to undergo recurrent surgeries, both for battery replacements and for lead refittings. And that is really where my team believes that there should be a better solution. And for us, the better solution is a biological pacemaker. And what I mean by a biological pacemaker is the idea to replace the damaged pacemaker cells with new functional pacemaker cells. And you already heard what we believe in in the Institute, what the source of these cells should be. These are the special pluripotent stem cells. So what I had to do during my postdoctoral fellowship in um, Dr. Keller's lab was really to figure out how do we turn that stem cell now into a pacemaker cell to make that vision of a biological pacemaker come true. And there we already had a good template from the pioneering work, both from Dr. Keller's lab and Dr. Laflamme's and others in the world, how to make a heart cell out of a stem cell. But we needed to still learn how to now make the special pacemaker cell. And for that, as uh, Dr. Keller already alluded to, we like to look at development of model organisms, especially the mouse. So we read into deeply into the literature to find those signals that are relevant to turn a stem cell into a pacemaker cell. And then we applied those signals to our Petri dish and indeed were in the end successful to turn them into human pacemaker cells. It's amazing. Now, because of COVID-19, we couldn't join you in the lab, which we really wanted to see, but I understand you've been kind enough to actually go shoot something yourself. Do you want to give us a little virtual lab tour with your video? Yes, I'm very happy to show you the little tour we shot together with my student. Welcome everyone to the lab spaces of the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. What we usually like to do for these behind the scenes tours is to have you come to the lab so we can show you where we culture ourselves and where we turn the stem cells into heart cells. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are unfortunately not able to have you here today. So what we sought to do instead was to give you a short virtual tour through the lab. Because of COVID-19, we also currently can't have a professional camera team on site, but one of my students volunteered to be the cameraman today. So let's go ahead and take a look inside of the lab. What we're seeing here on the right are our incubators. That's where we keep our cells in, and they're heated up to 37 degrees, so our cells are kept at 40 temperature. And you can see we don't just have one incubator. Um, my lab has four right now. We pretty much have one incubator per person working in the lab. So you can imagine that we have many of those within the whole institute. Another important equipment in our cell culture lab are our biological safety cabinets that you see over here. So they have a special air circulation, so everything inside is sterile. So that allows us to work with our cells without contaminating them. The other important equipment we have around here is our centrifuge. Over here, we use that to collect our cells using rotational forces. And the other key equipment you will see in the lab space is our microscopes over here that we obviously use to look at the cells. So let's go ahead and take a look at our cells. Let me just get one of our culture plates out of the incubator. So what you're seeing here is one of our standard six well culture dishes. And come a bit closer, you can actually see by eye the media that we're culturing the cells in here in pink and that is containing sugar and proteins that the cells feed on and also the growth factors that we use to differentiate the cells into heart cells. And we're changing this media about every two to four days within the biological safety cabinet you just saw. There's one more thing you can see by eye. If you, I'll take a closer look and I shake the plate a little bit. You see those white spots in the middle of the valves? These are the actually human heart cells. And of course, we can't see a single cell by eye, but what you can see is the aggregates that we culture them in. 
So each of these little white spots you're seeing contains about 100,000 cells, and each well contains about a million heart cells. Now, if you would be physically in the lab with me right now, I would ask you to look down the microscope to see the beating heart cells with your own eyes. What we will do instead today is we're going to show you videos of the regular ventricular heart cells that doctors Keller and Laflamme are going to use to cure patients after a heart attack and the pacemaker cells that my team is using to develop biological pacemakers. So let's go ahead and take a look and let's see if you can actually see a difference between the pacemaker cells and our ventricular cells. Thank you for bringing that along. It was wonderful to see what goes on behind the scenes in your lab. Uh, can I ask, are, are the pacemaker cells beating faster there than the other heart cells? Yeah, that's exactly one of the major differences you can already see by just looking at the cells. And that's because they're the drummer of the heart. They've got to give the beat. So they are the fastest cells. All right. So once you've made these cells, you've been successful at that, what's the path to bring this development into clinic for patients? So the next step is really to test that they can function as a biological pacemaker. And there's really two ways how we can do this. One way is we can do this in vitro in the Petri dish. And that is actually something I uh, can show you as well. And I brought a few uh, slides for that. So what we can do is we can take those regular cells that you've just seen and make a sheet of cells in the bottom of the Petri dish. And on top of that sheet of cells, we can then put an aggregate of those pacemaker cells of about 10,000 cells. And if that aggregate now functions as a pacemaker, it should be able to control the contraction of the cell sheet below. And if I start the video, you can see that that's exactly what's happening. The pacemaker um, aggregate starts contracting first, and then the bottom sheet is following. So the pacemaker cells do function as a biological pacemaker. And it looks a little bit like it's a ball jumping up and down on a trampoline here for that reason. Very cool. All right. I'm curious how your collaborations with Technion uh, are advancing your research, Dr. Pratza. Yeah, so the other option to test the biological pacemaker is using animal models, because we of course want to show that they can function in uh, vivo as well. And that is where we build a really strong collaboration with Technion and specific, specifically the lab of Dr. Leo Gapstein. And we've been very closely collaborating in the initial proof of concept studies where we basically made those pacemaker cells here in Toronto and used our expertise here. And then we shipped them via FedEx over um, to Haifa, to the Technion. And there, one of the really talented grad students from uh, the Gapstein lab injected these cells into the heart of rats. And then he um, kept these animals for two weeks. And after two weeks, he analyzed the hearts. And what he found was that those human pacemaker cells are now able to control the heartbeat of the red heart. And that was really the first time that we were able to show that these cells can function as a biological pacemaker in an animal model. And that wouldn't have been possible without the collaboration with Technion. Well, uh, Dr. Protz, thank you so much for sharing your amazing work with us. I want to bring Dr. Keller back in here to talk about the exciting future of cardiac stem cell research. Dr. Keller, it's clear you're working with a superstar team here, and it's, this is a world-leading research program at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute. Uh, what would you like to see happen uh, next for the cardiac research program here? Well, I think, uh, I think Michael, if I'm probably alluded to it, is to move uh, our, our lead uh, pro project, if you want, towards a therapy. That is, can we show that these cells, when transplanted into a patient, will, uh, will improve the function of that patient's heart? I mean, that is the ultimate goal. Uh, and that is certainly something that we're putting all our efforts into right now. Uh, we can, and then as Stephanie said, we can expand this beyond just the ventricular, the cardiac, or the heart attack model where you can replace other parts of the heart and then, of course, there's a whole area which we haven't touched on and, and we don't do much work on, and that's modeling diseases in a Petri dish, where you can imagine you can mod, mod, model study lethal arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation in the Petri dish. And we have co colleagues out in Vancouver who we're working with to, to look at that. 
Now you've been in this game a long time. What's your sense of how long before one of these treatments is in clinical trials? I think again, Mike hinted that at least three to four years till we could see these cells moving towards a patient. And that, uh, that is assuming that the, you know, the, the production goes well and the regulatory agencies approve uh, all the work we've done and believe that we have the best cells in the world to treat these patients. Anything else you want to add to, say, challenges uh, you face in moving to the next steps? There's, there's always challenges in our business. Uh, one of them, of course, is funding this work. We've, you know, we, we're all writing a lot of grants. We're all looking for funds. It becomes, as you progress more towards a clinical uh, experiment, it becomes more and more costly. Uh, the large animal models are very costly. And it's really this proof of principle, taking a cell that we can tell you should work, put it into an animal model and show that it does work. That is really the, the, the win, if you want, before you get to a patient. So finally, talk to us about donor support and how critical that is to helping advance your work and the work of your amazing researchers here today. Uh, donor support is, is, is all important here. It, it is because of donor support that I ended up in Toronto. It is because of donor support that we have a McEwen Stem Cell Institute. Uh, but now it's become even more important because we've advanced the field to where we can make all these great cell types. I mean, when I first came here, we used to have these, these get togethers and we would, we would argue that we will, we would predict that someday we'll be able to make these cells that we can someday treat patients with. Well, that someday is here. And what we need desperately to show before we will get approval from any uh, regulatory agency is that the cells we make are first safe when we put them into animal models and they will provide benefit. Uh, they will improve the, 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 the organ that is damaged, let's say. And uh, th that type of work is hard to fund through federal grants and that type of work is hard to fund through um, biotech and pharma because they want to see the data before they'll fund it. And so it's, it's, it's this valley where we, we really struggle to, to fill that gap with funding to say, we have really the best cells on the planet and we believe, we strongly believe they're going to function. We just need the resources to show it. Now, Michael, one more thing. Uh, could you take us back to 2016 and a really seminal moment in terms of the McEwen Stem Cell Institute and yours and Dr. Keller's relationship with a company called Blue Rock Therapeutics? Yeah, so it was because of the work we had done in the McEwen uh, Stem Cell Institute, in particular, two advances. Um, we were able to draw the attention of the biotechnology industry. So first, the demonstration that we were able to make the correct type of heart muscle cell, the ventricular heart muscle cell that you, you lose in a heart attack and to make them at scale. And also the successful demonstration that we could implant those cells and that they would stably engraft and improve outcomes in animal models, particularly in large animal models, that it drew the attention of a um, venture capital company called uh, Versant and a pharma company that probably most of you have heard of, Bayer or Bayer. Um, and they came together in late 2016 to uh, launch a company called Blue Rock Therapeutics, um, which emerged with an initial investment of 225 million US dollars, which I believe at the time was the second largest um, biotechnology uh, launch in terms of dollars, not in Canada, ever, worldwide. Um, and they've expanded tremendously since. I believe there are up to 80 or 90 employees in Toronto alone. Um, and uh, were recently actually acquired by uh, Bayer fully uh, with a valuation of a billion dollars. Those kind of deep pockets, those kind of resources are what's gonna be necessary. It's the kind of partnership that we require to, to make this a successful therapy. Um, with investments from philanthropy and from government, we can do some of the initial proof of concept work, um, but to, to manufacture the uh, tremendously large numbers of cells that we've talked about, and to also push this work through costly clinical trials, um, we really needed a partner like Blue Rock. 
So we're re really excited um, and are hoping we can work with them on other applications as well. So no question, there are exciting innovations happening in cardiac stem cell therapy at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute and groundbreaking treatments to come from these dedicated researchers. All right, now it's your turn. Questions have been coming in during the conversation and we wanna to get to those and bring in all our researchers. First question, uh, this is for Michael, Dr. Laflamme. Why are preclinical models an important part of the research process? Thank, thanks for the question. So uh, the first reason is scientific. You know, we have ideas, but we need to test out those ideas. We can't predict how our cells are gonna uh, function in a body um, by experiments you do in a computer program or, or in a dish. We actually need to test them out in a model, a model that has the disease. Um, the second reason we talked about this um, earlier is the regulatory agencies very understandably want us to show that the new therapies that we're developing are uh, safe and effective. Um, and so if we're gonna go to Health Canada or the Food and Drug Administration and say, hey, we wanna try this in humans, we need to get that data first. And so there's kind of a whole preclinical pipeline that we need to do experiments in um, to, to show that. Um, the next reason is, is practical. Um, as you heard about from Gordon, to, to get this over the next hump, um, when you have a, a therapy like this, we're gonna have to do that in partnership with industry, with biotechnology companies, like uh, like the relationship that we formed in, in Blue Rock. And the truth is to get the intention and to, to, to get companies like that to be willing to make an investment in an idea like this, you, you, you need to have a little bit of evidence, a little bit of data that, uh, that, that the therapy looks like it might work. You gotta show them that you have the disease models with which to test it. And so I think, you know, what, what we've done with Blue Rock is kind of an illustration of that because um, you know, that early kind of proof of concept data um, that I talked about, we achieved that with support from, from philanthropy um, through the McEwen uh, Stem Cell Institute. So it, that, that sort of philanthropic support is really the, the seed corn for everything we'll do. Fantastic. All right, next question has come in from Beth Coley. Thank you, Beth, for your question. She says, as I'm watching Dr. Keller's presentation and his second cart concerning induced pluripotent stem cells, there's, not, there's one thing I do not understand. Do the, sem, do the cells taken from the blood samples have to come from the patient who will later receive the new and improved cells, or can they come from another, another individual? Gordon? Uh, that's a very good question. So the, um, it depends on the application you want to use the cells for. Uh, if you want to study a disease that the patient has, for instance, if there's a genetic disease that causes heart dysfunction, you would use your own cells, you would reprogram them, and you would make your own heart cells in a Petri dish, and then you would study those heart cells, in the, your own heart cells in the Petri dish, show the defect, and then say, can we find, use these cells to perhaps find new therapies? I think the question that went more to the second application, and, and that is if we were gonna treat you, your own, let's say if you had a heart ailment that needed cell therapy, would we use your own cells? In an ideal world, yes, we would take your blood cells, reprogram them, make your heart cells, put them back into your heart and fix it. Now, that is probably not the way it's gonna happen for several reasons, mostly expense and cost to make stem cells and heart cells from each patient. That experiment was done once in Japan for replacing part of the eye or cells in the eye and it cost just the safety part cost over a million dollars. So rather than that, the field is moving towards making universal cells and that's where you genetically alter the stem cells so they're, so they're invisible if you want to the immune system and these are called uh, universal cells we then make those, we then make heart cells from those universal stem cells, and those can be used to treat probably anyone on the planet. And it's just a more efficient and more rapid way to do it. Thanks, Dr. Keller. Um, over, this is for Dr. Pratza. In a podcast interview, you described your lab as being in its infancy. Could you explain for us what's involved in lab startup and, and the challenges of scaling up? Sure. Um, yeah, that's very true. I started the lab about two years ago now, and I won't lie, it's stressful, but it's also very exciting times. 
So we basically started out as an empty lab space. And the first thing is you got to put equipment in. And I think you saw in the video that we've successfully done that. The next thing is you got to put a team together. You got to train staff. So we started doing that. I hired a technician and I now have two graduate students. We're currently looking for postdocs to join us as well to really get the projects moving. And by the time you start working and generate data, you realize you're starting to run out of your startup money. So you have to start writing grants. And that's what we, uh, I started doing and also successfully obtained some of those, uh, as it was mentioned by Cheryl at the beginning and by both Mike and Gordon as well. Those grants don't really um, support us in moving the biological pacemaker to the clinic. Because what we want to do is moving to pick studies similar to what um, Mike is doing to really test the safety of the biological pacemaker in this preclinical model. And for that, we really require the donor support to make the next leap. Thank you, Dr. Pratza. Uh, another question, this one is coming from Jeff Rubenstein. It was pointed out that the program is at the stage where they can make all types of heart cells. We know scarring is a problem, re stress on the heart function. Have you been able in your research to inject these heart stem cells into a heart that has scarring and prove it's benef beneficial or is it just theory at this point? I'm guessing Dr. Laflan, would that be you? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, depends on the model that, that we're talking about. So what we have shown in a, a variety of different models is that the cells will implant. We can find the cells there still um, a year after they're implanted and they are forming human heart muscle. We've shown in small animal models and non-human primate models that the cells do mediate beneficial effects on contractile function, so the heart pumps better. What hasn't been shown and what we're trying to do now is to show that we see those same beneficial effects in the pig model. And as I said, that's kind of job one that we have right now in the laboratory. And again, that's because the pig heart is about as close as you can get to a human heart um, without touching an actual human. So that, that's what we're really trying to do. Uh, I think we're nearing our end of our hour, but I want to get one last question is if I can. This is to you, Dr. Keller. Why do we hear about stem cell therapies happening in other parts of the world? Um, well, I think you're probably referring to uh, those types of therapies you find on the internet would be my, my guess. Uh, of course, there are, there are legitimate stem cell therapies going on and bone marrow transplantation is, is the poster child if you want for that, where you replace and uh, recharge the blood cell system. But there have sprung up throughout the world and even here in Canada, uh, so-called stem cell clinics that will take most often what's called a mesenchymal cell or a fibroblast, kind of probably the same type of cell that forms the scar tissue in the heart. And we'll go ahead and, and, and take them out of your body, out of your fat tissue, they're there and inject them somewhere else in your body and claim benefit. And if you take it out of your body and inject it back in, uh, if you do it under a certain, uh, if, if you don't manipulate them too much, you just can go ahead and do that. The problem with these types of experiments is there's no clinical trial, there's no blinded trial. So there, there isn't a number, set of patients that got some of the cells and some that did not. Everyone gets the cells, everyone claims to get better, and they take everybody's money for it. These are largely not the type of therapies you ever want to get into. Unless there's bona fide clinical trial data to back it up. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Keller. And listen, we've come to the end of our time. It went by really quickly. I hope you found this engaging. Uh, thank you to all our doctors who joined us today, Dr. Keller, Dr. Laflamme and Dr. Pratza for sharing your groundbreaking research at the McEwen Stem Cell Institute and continued success to all of you. Uh, and I wanna thank our audience for joining us this evening. Uh, we hope you found this uh, stimulating. And as we come to a close, I wanna quickly hand this back over to Cheryl McEwen, who I know has a few special words and a special announcement to make. Stay safe, everyone. I'm almost ready to share my exciting announcement with you. But before I do, over thank to Adina. You, Cheryl, and thank you for this amazing uh, opportunity this evening. I, I just wanted to share with our guests that how Michael and I take all these amazing things and contribute in our way is by supporting fellows like Dr. Pratza and her team. 
And we have found that that's really a great bang for your buck um, because it's not, you know, putting your name on a building kind of level, but it's something um, that really has an impact. And even if let's say that's not appropriate, then, you know, get five friends together and, and support in that way. So we, we really found that that's the, the best way to, to give back. Over to Cheryl, thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. And I hope you can see why we are excited. Uh, we are truly on the cusp of bringing stem cell therapy to the patient. Success in the heart will open the pathway to using stem cell therapy for so many other disease conditions several of which are well established and ready to transition with Dr. Keller's team. UHN is becoming a hub for stem cells, and that means saving lives, creating new jobs, commercialization, and contributing to our Canadian economy. Now for our, my special announcement. We have a donor who will match your gifts of 5,000, 10,000, 25,000, this will double your impact. This is a great opportunity to leverage your gift. We currently have an urgent campaign to raise $5 million over the next four years for this cardiac program to meet its goals. If you have the capacity to make a larger gift, we will find a way to optimize your donation. Remember, this is how we get to therapy faster. Private donations are the fuel to discovery. We need your help to get there. So please consider joining us as champions of stem cell research. We will send out a follow-up email so you can connect with us. It will provide an overview of areas to support. And if you have any questions you didn't get a chance to ask, please let us know. A special thanks to Christian for moderating tonight, he will continue to offer live streaming events to showcase the incredible work of all the scientists in their areas of stem cell therapy for many different diseases. Well, we've come a very long way with private donations and for that we are extremely grateful. Thank you to so many people who over the years have given their support to help us get this far. Thank you to incredible events like Grand Cru, which has provided much needed funding when gaps occurred. And a special thank you to our donor tonight who is stepping up to double your donation. It really does take a village to enable the stem cell revolution. Let's do it together. Thank you.